that very kind introduction. I'm going to set this That's okay. And thank you all of you for coming, especially um, given the circumstances. So what I'm going to do today is to try to give the broad outlines of a high medieval perception of, of the high medieval perception of social order. And this, uh, this perception and the practice of it is very, very different from our own. And it's an order that I'll argue today is congruent with a sacramental worldview that is based ultimately on the virtues of faith, hope, and charity and the reality of those virtues. But where I want to start is actually by looking at the modern <coughs> worldview and, and the worldview in which we find ourselves. So the modern vision is secular. But what I mean by this is important. I don't mean that there is some sort of essential choice between religion and secularity that is timeless and omnipresent, and that modernity has chosen secularity. Rather, to modernity, reality itself is ultimately free of religious things as a matter of definition. Religion can come and go, but the secular is fundamental. The secular is the field on which the game of history is played, and religion is a category that functions within the secular. Religion is relative as religion. It is a part of the essence of secularism that there is a real choice between religion and non-religion, and that when religion is removed, what is left is the secular. Religion is here a secular category. Such religion has content only within the secular frame. Once we realize this, secularization as a process takes on a very different character. The sociologist of religion, Peter Berger, wrote, quote, by secularization we mean the process by which sectors of society and culture are removed from the domination of religious institutions and symbols, end quote. Now this is, of course, a typical textbook definition of secularization. The problem, however, is that, is that religious institutions and symbols are only recognizable as religious. They are recognizable as religious only from the vantage point of the secular. This means that secularization might be just as legitimately understood as being the process by which sectors of society and culture are construed as religious institutions and symbols. In other words, secularization is the process through which the religious as such was created, thereby opening a non-religious realm. Before the secular, there wasn't religion either. To modernity, if a religion is fundamentally social, if it is fundamentally political, if it is fundamentally economic, if it is intrinsically material, if it is in fact fundamental to society at all, then it is no true religion, because religion isn't this way. It is rather private, spiritual, reflective, relative, and finally, optional. This is merely a matter of definitions. It is with this set of categories that modernity approaches the medieval period. When moderns look at the Middle Ages, we see a society that we recognize as religious, in the same sort of way that we say a particular person is religious today. He goes to church, he prays, he talks about God, and so on. Religion, religion is important in his life, but it could go away. He could abandon his religion and become secular, and he would still be him. And this is so because the secular is always there. It is the there where religion functions. So we read this understanding of religion back into the period and then move forward constructing a narrative to show how we ultimately choose non-religion in the public space, which is another way of saying how we ultimately sorted religious things properly into the religious category and secular things into the secular category, an outcome that was predetermined at the, at the outset of the investigation. It's a giant process of begging the question. There are many, many aspects of this narrative, but I'm going to focus, what I'm going to focus on today is what we might call politics. Many of us are probably familiar with at least the broad outlines of modernity's narrative of church and state. To summarize, in the Middle Ages, the papacy battled the monarchs over sovereignty. This was a protracted struggle from the investiture controversy in the 11th century to the Avignon papacy in the 14th. Over the course of this struggle, as the popes attempted to extend their power, they were forced to spend the papacy's moral capital engaging in dirty political power struggles, as well as stretch the ideology of papal monarchy into a theory of worldwide theocracy. 
as the papacy drifted from its proper, properly religious and spiritual role, as it struggled to gain control of the secular sphere of politics, it debased its authority, becoming corrupt and legalistic. In the process, it lost the moral authority and prestige it once held. This conflict ended with the ignoble defeat of Boniface VIII at the hands of Philip IV, from which it was a short journey to French domination of the Avignon Papacy, to schism, and ultimately to the Reformation. The papacy's decline is contrasted with the rise of the monarchies, who in this narrative achieved independence and real sovereignty. As the story goes, the renewed study of Roman law provided the state with the legal concepts needed to justify itself without religion. Theologically, Aquinas finally dispensed with Augustine's notion that the state was the consequence of sin and asserted, based on Aristotle, that the state was natural to mankind. Embracing this theological and legal self-sufficiency and having bested the church, the monarchs set about building their states. Within this narrative, the kings are certainly religious, but it is the modern understanding of religion that I just discussed. It is religion here as ideology or as personal piety. Because of this, religion remains an accident to the king's essence as the state. Ideologies can change and personal piety fade away without the essence of the state being undermined. Within the narrative, the anointed kings of the high middle ages were the state. And when their ideology shifted to that of absolutism in the early modern period, they remained the state. And when ultimately the monarchies gave way to modern secular legislators and secular dictators, these remain the state. The secular state is the constant because the modern secular state is really where we started. It is really the only political category that is in play in the narrative. What we see in this story first is the assumption of the religion secular option, of the distinction of church and state as being a real distinction that is prior to any particular historical manifestation, which amounts to the priority of the non-religious sphere, which is the assumption of secularity. Second, we see that this narrative is dependent on certain modern assumptions about how politics work. One of these assumptions is that sovereignty necessarily exists. What is sovereignty? The sovereign is that entity that wields force without reference to any other human entity. All legitimate force is ultimately a delegation from the sovereign, and the sovereign has always and everywhere the right to intervene. Within the standard narrative, sovereignty is what the popes and kings were really fighting over, a prize that by definition cannot be shared. However, it is my contention here that along with the religious and the secular, sovereignty did not exist in the 13th century, not because the organizational or intellectual technologies had not yet, been, not yet been invented, but because, like the concept of religion, the concept of sovereignty and the attempt to build sovereign states is distinctly modern, and at root a rejection of a Christian understanding and experience of politics. Ultimately, the assumption that compels modernity to see sovereignty as always historically relevant, the assumption that really underpins modern political thought, is that of a primordial and ubiquitous violence, a notion articulated so clearly by Thomas Hobbes in his War of All Against All. The liberalism that developed out of Hobbes and Locke conceives of, hum of human interactions as at root contractual and of contracts as a type of compromise in the face of conflict, in the face of scarcity. Because all non-violent human interactions are ultimately contractual and based on property rights, and the state is, what, is that which enforces contracts and property rights, there is within liberalism itself the presupposition of the ubiquitous power of the sword, which is sovereignty. In this way of thinking, in the face of perpetual violence, peace is possible only through the imposition of a greater violence that can suppress all other conflicts. Sovereignty is a concept that allows for a legitimate manifestation of this overawing violence. If one assumes conflict and one desires peace, one is almost compelled to locate sovereignty somewhere and to defend it. Because this scenario operates at the level of an assumption, history is seen as the struggle over sovereignty. In the Middle Ages, as the story goes, the church made a bid for sovereignty. 
It attempted a religious state, a theocracy. This attempt put it necessarily in conflict with the secular monarchies. The modern development of the secular state and the religious church is seen as the final resolution of the struggle, but not without the bloodletting of the 16th and 17th centuries. The story of sovereignty, the story of church and state, and the story of the religious and the secular are therefore totally bound up together as interlacing plot lines in the same meta-narrative. But this narrative is wrong. So first, I want to look at the relationship between the so-called religious and secular by looking at the relationship between heresy and violence in the context of the Albigensian Crusade in southern France, which launched in 1209. We are accustomed to talking about the Albigensian Crusade as being directed against the Cathar dualist heresy, and this is true, but it's also very misleading. It is misleading because the modern understanding of religion is necessarily carried into the meaning of the word heresy. In order to set this aside, I'm going to use the name for the conflict that the people actually engaged in it used. They called it the business of the peace and the faith. As the name suggests, they understood a direct connection between peace and faith, and so between heresy and violence. This wasn't just conceptual. Rather, the, the campaign itself was as directed against bands of mercenaries and marauders who had turned the region into a constant war zone as it was against the black-robed Cathars. In fact, the word marauder or mercenary and the word heretic were more or less interchangeable. This sometimes baffles modern historians because they fail to see what the people of the period were seeing which was the inseparable, inseparable unity of faith and peace. When Pope Innocent III exhorted King Philip II of France to take up his sword in the business of the peace and the faith, he wrote, quote, Notice that through Moses and Peter, the fathers of both testaments, is signified a unity between kingship and priesthood, since one is called the priestly king and the other is called a royal priest. By this is signified that Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, according to the order of Melchizedek, wanted the races of both priests and of kings to, to each be born from both the priestly and the royal. The Pope further explained that both the temporal and the spiritual swords existed within the Church of Christ, one wielded by kings, the other by priests, but that their unity was foundational. It was rooted in the unity of the Old and New Testaments. The Pope exhorted Philip in the image of King Solomon to suppress those who destroyed both the peace and the faith in his kingdom. This relationship between the old and the new is very important for understanding the connection between heresy and violence, so bear with me as I make a diversion here into medieval exegesis. Within the dominant four senses of scripture structure of the period, the reader of the scripture started with the literal, the historical the realm of things and events. But then, as his faith deepened, he progressed into the allegorical, to seeing Christ and the church as the actual meaning of scripture. And on from there, up the ladder of ascent, he moved into charity, into the tropological sense, in which he conformed himself morally to Christ. That is to say, he became a sort of living scripture, which manifested itself in preaching. And then on from there, towards contemplation and total understanding in the anagogical sense, the meaning of scripture and the spiritual scent were therefore directly connected. The ever-deepening meaning of scripture was only exhausted within the perfect charity of the life of God, and so the saint understood the scripture more completely than the mere scholar. But at no point in this spiritual and intellectual ascent was the historical abandoned or rendered obsolete or meaningless. Rather, its full meaning was only revealed as the reader progressed through the senses, which was the progression into faith and charity. All the senses of Scripture depended upon and presupposed the historical foundation, but as the reader progressed in his understanding, which meant necessarily progressing in his, in his conversion, the historical sense was brought up into and fulfilled in the spiritual senses, like a boy becoming a man with nothing left behind. We need to keep this dynamic in mind in what follows. So as we've seen, they understood the church to hold two swords, the temporal and the spiritual, 
Both these powers were in the church. So let's look first at the temple. The king, the temporal power, was understood explicitly in the place of King David. To those who lived in the realm of the simply historical, those who were worldly and sensual, the king was an Old Testament king in the literal historical sense. He was the sword operating from the position of the law to which they were subject to coercion, through fear. As the Christian moved up the ladder of ascent, however, this temporal power transitioned away from the old and into the new, ultimately to the kingship of the Prince of Peace himself, whose authority was rooted in love and filial obedience rather than servile fear. It is not that kingship was somehow made obsolete or repudiated in this ascending transformation. Far from it. Rather, it was fulfilled in the same way that the historical was fulfilled in the spiritual. <clears throat> The Old Testament Davidic monarchy was, of course, read allegorically as the New Testament monarchy of Christ. They were ultimately the same kingship in different levels of fulfillment. So the further the people ascended toward perfection, the more the Davidic kingship of the Christian king that they were under approached the perfection of Christ's kingship. The temporal power ran from top to bottom in the ladder of ascent. At the bottom, it fought. At the top, it ruled eternally with Christ himself in perfect peace. This is why they, and this includes the papacy, uh, didn't hesitate to refer to the kings as vicars of Christ. The king's office, his job, was to produce peace temporally, and in so doing, bring heaven and earth closer together. As he did this, the need for the iron sword would fade away, because it was necessary only where there was sin. The pursuit of true peace was nothing other than the pursuit of salvation itself, an objective dependent upon sacramental grace, and so on the priesthood, on the church's second power, the spiritual power. In peace, the law was fulfilled, for peace was nothing less than the universalization of the love of God and love of neighbor. Both the spiritual and temporal power were oriented toward this end of peace, and so salvation. The law led to and was fulfilled in grace. Within this understanding, the church's wielding of the sword was an act of peace, an act of charity. Like the kings of the Old Testament, the kings themselves were essential to the salvation offered by the church and were in no way somehow outside of it. The new was prepared for in the old, and grace was prepared for through law. The old and the law were necessary. Within this vision, then, the two powers were really one power operating at different levels in the hierarchy of, sent to, of ascent to God, like how the old law and the new law are really the single divine law. Where faith and charity failed, one found oneself back in simple history, in the realm of the sword. But as we have seen, this was not a realm that fell outside of Christianity. It was the foundation on which the church was built. It was the law, the Old Testament, the literal sense. This foundation had not been abolished. Rather, it was being fulfilled as the society of the baptized became more closely united in grace as the body of Christ. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so the validity of coercive power was directly connected to the validity of the Old Testament. It is perhaps not surprising then to find the dualist, that the dualist heretics who denied the validity of the Old Testament also asserted that all use of the sword was mortal sin, necessarily. The Orthodox identified this as one of their chief errors and, co and connected it explicitly to their denial of the Old Testament. And this error was, error was furthermore directly connected to the reality of violent laymen in the region, the mercenaries and marauders who were the protectors of the heretics and against whom the war was actually fought. How was this connection made? As we have seen, the Orthodox understood the spiritual and the temporal is always bound up together, but they were bound up together in a dynamic of ascent within which the temporal was perfected in the spiritual. The dualists, on the other hand, viewed the spiritual and the temporal as fundamentally at odds, in fact, as at war with each other. The dualists believed that the material world was the realm of the evil principle, that it could not be redeemed. In such a world, world, the very notion of moral temporal power was an absurdity. 
The world was violent and disordered. Those who lived in it were violent and disordered. There could be no morality that would suggest they'd be otherwise, no true peace that they could achieve. This theology justified the violence of the marauding laity because it could not imagine anything else. There was no assent for the laity to charity, no turning of their temporal vocation into the very mission of the church and so of Christ, no Davidic kingship or chivalric knighthood. There were no sacraments, no Eucharist, no marriage, even, even eating defiled a person. They denied the possibility of a holy laity and so of the temporal power of the church. As orthodoxy included within it both the temporal and the spiritual powers, so dualism included within it both the mercenaries and the heretics. So we can see that to the orthodox, inhabiting a sacramental cosmos, the heretics and the violent laymen were two sides of the same coin. The divine and the human, the soul and the body, the spiritual and the temporal, the doctrinal and the practical, the allegorical and the literal, the new and the old testaments, remained totally bound up together. This was at the very core of orthodoxy. And within this orthodoxy was a notion of a social order of peace and how it was achieved through ascent from the simply temporal into the spiritual, but without leaving the temporal behind. The business of the peace and the business of the faith were, to the orthodox, clearly the same business. The priests, the spiritual power, were engaged in the business, and so too were the knights, the temporal power each in their own way. Within this worldview, heresy necessarily had repercussions for social order. Right belief, right worship, the reception of the sacraments, and right social order, that is to say peace, were completely dependent on each other. Now what I've done here, I hope, is accounted for the data of the sources in a manner that does not force us to posit modern categories of the religious and the secular, of church and state. Rather, if we use the categories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and of the senses of Scripture that were understood as uniting the two Testaments and each other to the reader of the Bible, we can more accurately account for what we actually find in the sources. And what we actually find is that temporal and spiritual were, the temporal and the spiritual were always together, but not in a static constitution or some sort of Gelasian division of spheres, but in a dynamic of ascent within which they transitioned from the exterior to the interior, from the simply old to the new, from law to virtue, together. The two powers, like the body and the soul, ran together from bottom to top, from merely history to heaven itself. Our adjectives, political, secular, or religious, are simply not applicable to what we see in the sources. And this is so not because the people of the Middle Ages were super religious when they did politics, or conversely, that they were super political when they did religion. Rather, the secular field on which these concepts do their work simply did not exist. The ecclesia subsisted in the realm of time and things, indeed. But the realm of time and things was precisely the realm of Scripture, of the incarnate Christ, of the Eucharist. It was also the realm of the Church's enemies. This was a sacramental worldview. In such a world, there is no secular. The field on which history is played is the church itself. History is salvation history, nothing else. Now for the second plague of the modern meta narrative, that of sovereignty. We might be tempted to think that what I just described is a recipe for theocracy, for an intolerant authoritarianism. Within this understanding, are not all conflicts in society ultimately conflicts between rival totalizing theocracies? The answer is no, and the reason is that the overriding logic of this understanding is the logic of peace, not that of violence. To put it simply, sovereignty did not exist, and so states, theocratic or otherwise, could not exist. The statement is not evasive, I mean it very literally. In contradistinction to modern politics, which are built on the assumption of ubiquitous violence, this society was organized around the notion of peace, a peace that was real and not simply another name for submission. This peace was constantly being shattered by outbursts of violence, certainly, and legitimate power fought this violence, kept it at bay, and protected the peace. Legitimate power, however, was not monopolized, and there was no notion that it should be. As I have asserted, the, the, the desirability of a monopoly on the use of force 
is a consequence of the belief in the ubiquity of violence. If violence is everywhere, peace is possible only when this ubiquity is in the hands of one will. Um, here, sovereignty is not only inevitable, it is desirable. However, if peace is real, such sovereignty is not only unnecessary, it is inevitably tyrannical. This was the case in the Christian society of 13th century France, because to it, peace was real. The society's order was congruent with a metaphysics of peace and abundance, of which the Trinity is the ultimate source. The persons of the Trinity are completely differentiated, each defined by his relationship with the other persons. Their peace, however, is complete, so complete that the three persons are one divinity. Through a very distant analogy, a father and a son and a human family live together in differentiation. This differentiation is the foundation of their peace. They experience the peace of family life when they are solidly different from each other and yet bound together in intrinsic relation. Like how a hand and a foot are both more different from each other and more united than are two grains of sand in a pile of sand. This familial differentiation remains recognizable even in modern society as a little island of difference in the vast sea of sameness. In the family, we experience the breakdown of the contractual, rights-based mode of interaction based on constant, if mitigated, conflict. We think peace should really be possible in the family because we know family members are really different from each other. Peace and difference go together, even for us. Rather than based on contracts, the parent-child relationship is based on things like duties, self-sacrifice, obedience, gifts, and ultimately love all things that rely upon a fundamental inequality between persons. It is in this difference that they form a family at peace, which constitutes a truly common good, which is a good that can only be had when it is good together, when it is had together. In fact, they are fully father and son, only within this peace. To the extent that their relationship requires laws, rules, contracts, or compromises, their relationship is not essentially that of father and son. Now, we should not have too much trouble imagining this type of relationship extending beyond the immediate family in ever bigger circles involving more and more of the people with whom an individual interacts, even to the point of encompassing an entire society. Imagining such a thing is not the same as imagining a society without conflict. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters argue all the time. Rather, it is imagining a society in which their conflict does not fit in which it is a tear in the social fabric rather than the threads that make it up. According to this logic, peace exists in society through its nature as radically differentiated. Society exists ordered in distributive justice. Injustice ripped this fabric of order here or there, but it was the exception rather than the rule. Human nature was wounded, not totally depraved. Coercion was therefore deployed justly only in response to violence and never proactively. Otherwise, it was just more violence. Where differentiated persons operated justly, the sword had nothing to do. Coercion, or positive law then, was not the ordering principle of society, but rather always remedial, always situational, and never absolute. Not only was coercion not absolute, it was not monopolized. The notion that violence was somehow properly restricted to a certain man or institution throughout the kingdom was foreign to its logic. The right to deploy the exceptional use of physical force was rather dispersed throughout society, and it was profoundly context-based. Here, in this place, in this situation, between these particular people, a certain person could wield the sword. Change one piece of context, and it could be someone else. This is the part that I think is really weird for us, but bear with me here. Legitimacy here arose out of differentiation and not out of the sameness of contract administration or modern rights. Force could be used by those who peacefully used it. Those who used it not proactively, but within the context-bound social order that was known as simply the peace. Now to see how this worked concretely, I'm going to give a, a, a couple examples from St. Louis Parliament, which was the High Court of France. In the records of Parliament, we see that different entities in different locations held different shares of justice, which is the power to capture, try, and punish criminals. 
For example, early in 1257, two men had been captured around a village in the outskirts of Paris by knights of a local abbot. Their crime was passing counterfeit money at the market, and the abbot tried them and hanged them. The abbot did this because he believed himself to hold justice over the crime of false money in the village. The king's provost in Paris claimed that, ju that justice over this crime, in fact, pertained to the king because he held high justice. This was the term that was normally used for jurisdiction over capital crimes, murder, rape, treason, sometimes robbery. Because of the provost's claim, the king ordered that the hanged men be taken down from the abbot's gallows and rehanged on his. The abbot protested, and so the king ordered an inquest. The investigation determined that indeed the abbot did have the possession of justice over false money in the village, but not because he held all high justice. Rather, the question of who held high justice remained open, except in the case of robbery, which the inquest had found that the king held. Because of this ruling, the king ordered that the criminals be taken down, taken down from his own gallows and hanged yet again on the abbot's gallows. This, the records of Parliament state, was to show that the way of justice had been liberated. There is no notion here of some sort of special claim of the king over legitimate violence. What made violence legitimate was that the enforcer held the right to wield it in a concrete, historical, and not abstract way. The second thing we should see in the example is the empty space. There was a problem with false money, and Parliament determined that the abbot held the right to justice in this case, just as it also determined that the king had the right to thieves. But who held the right to justice over other crimes? This remained an open question because it had not come up as a dispute. Parliament did not assign or delegate the legitimate use of force. It discovered it. It discovered who had it. This discovery occurred in reaction to conflict, to a shattering of the peace. So this, we see here, open space, which is an idea impossible within the bounds of sovereignty, within which every little piece of course of power is accounted for. Through the thousands of recorded investigations and rulings of Parliament concerning this web of rights and justice, there is never some notion that all of it is derived from, from one meta-right to justice that is somehow delegated by the king to subordinates. Reading this into the documents is a great temptation for modern historians who want so badly to find sovereignty somewhere However, I do not believe it to be there. It was quite possible for it to be an act of criminal violence for the king to capture, try, and punish a criminal because he did not possess justice in that particular circumstance. Rather, the crown intervened only when the peace was broken, when two or more parties disagreed on who had possession of justice, when scarcity was actually experienced. What is more, rights to the wielding of force were not somehow privileged. This is an important point. In modern political theory, we single out physical coercion as being categorically distinct from any other activity in society. The reason we do this, though, is that the order of our society is based on the monopolization of coercion by the state. Our society tends to abhor any act of so-called private violence because such use of force necessarily challenges the basis of our society's peace which rests on the exclusive violence of the state. Non-state violence is taboo. This was not the case in 13th century France. Peace did not rest on violence. Rather, peace was understood as the way things were. A criminal fractured this peace through violence, and when he did so, he needed to be stopped and peace restored. In order for this exceptional but necessary action to take place without more conflict, in any given situation, only one person should act. But this one person worked for the peace, right order, and justice itself, not for some state. He derived his legitimate use of force from the very nature of society. He derived his legal right to wield for, real force from the simple fact that he was the one in those parts that did so when those parts were at peace. Whenever there was a situation in which differentiation had broken down, where scarcity, scarcity led to conflict, Parliament sought to determine and maintain the peace. In this process, rights made an appearance. Rights to justice, rights to resources, rights to certain taxes, rights to certain offices, even rights to certain interpersonal interactions. But these rights only emerged once a scarcity-induced conflict had, in fact, occurred, 
and such a conflict could occur in any sector of society. There was no universal code of law and rights within which conflict and cooperation could function. Rather, all conflict was eligible for a rights solution. For example, the peasants of a certain village went every spring to a nearby wood to cut down the dead trees for firewood. One year, the local knights stopped them on the way and took their laden carts. They protested, saying, we have always taken firewood from this forest. Indeed, responded the knight, but you have always only taken one cartload. This year you have two. Parliament held an inquest and ruled that in the, ruled that in the previous 40 years, Sometimes the peasants had loaded one cart, and sometimes they had loaded two. The knight was wrong and violated the peace through his actions, and so he had to pay amends. But what is really important is that now the peasants have a right to the dead wood in the forest, two cartloads. Before the conflict, it was just something they did within the peace. Conflict changed the situation, and the conflict was not solved by appeal to abstract and universal rights and laws, but to the particulars of time and place before the conflict had erupted. That is to say, to the peace. And the rights that emerged were always limited and particular. Such rights were literally forgotten as peace was restored in these real relationships between particular persons, as they or their children or grandchildren transitioned from being enemies to being once again friends, as they returned to the peace. Rights necessarily faded away along with the conflict that had called them into being. Such rights were formed and forgotten and formed again as generations moved through life in the space of peace. If conflict was a tear in the social fabric, the temporal power was a tailor who sought to patch it. It is not that positive laws, contracts, and rights did not exist, they clearly did, but they were these patches, these compromises. They were disconnected, and if the whole universe of positive laws, rights, obligations, and contracts were added up, they would come nowhere close to covering the social field. This is why they had markets, but no the market. Why they had courts, but no justice system. What we are seeing is a world without even theoretical sovereignty, because it is a world not premised on a ubiquitous violence. There were hundreds of thousands of people engaged in countless activities and interacting with each other in countless ways. Some of these activities and interactions we now associate with the state or with government. Others we would now associate with economics, family, entertainment, or religion. But our categories are largely irrelevant. All of these activities, the way the population went about all its business, constituted the society's order known as the peace. This peace was not sovereign. This peace and not sovereign power was the basis of order. The truth is that sovereignty can be found in the period only through the practice of sorting the historical data into modern categories. These categories are those that underpin the state and its corollary, the market, within which the world is seen is basically seen as a sea of more or less interchangeable individuals, citizens, and workers engaged in a social order underwritten by scarcity or conflict that is regularized through precise law and bureaucracy. There is no empty space in this order. Every bit of power is accounted for, as is every bit of property. Sovereignty is the one thing that stands over and against this homogeneity. Our mistake is to suppose this order of things is the way human beings are in their nature. 13th century France was not so ordered. There was a great deal of empty space and thousands upon thousands of unique actors with masses of disconnected rights and liberties. In this way, I contend, not, it was this way, I contend, not because they had not yet figured out how to build the state. It was this way because they understood the world as temporal, differentiated, and ultimately peaceful, rather than as somehow static, ideally entirely undifferentiated, and ultimately in perpetual conflict. Now I'd like to combine the two major sections of this talk, the first part about the world not being divided into the secular and the religious, and the second that there was no sovereignty. How do they get together? The answer is that they fit together directly. First, the rights, powers, liberties, and obligations of ecclesiastical persons subsisted within the same differentiated piece as those of the temporal powers. They formed a part of the context of an encounter between actors in the same manner as did temporal rights and obligations. 
Some people bore ecclesiastical or spiritual rights, uses, or possessions, and others did not. But all people operated in the same space, according to the same notion of justice, and the peace could be destroyed through the abuse of any practice or right, ecclesiastical or temporal. Because this was a world without sovereignty, there is no need to posit some sort of constitutional arrangement between church and state, or to fashion them as parallel or stacked institutions. In the open, differentiated space of the peace, the spiritual and the temporal could interact directly anywhere within a single matrix of social order without either one being seen as the source of that social order. The bishops had the right, the power, to excommunicate in a way similar to how one might have the right to justice over, say, thieves. In neither case did this right descend from the king, but also in neither case did the existence of this right challenge the king's rule. Clerics were different from laymen, however. Clerics, especially bishops, were capable of holding types of jurisdiction that laymen could not. This was a part of their differentiated practice. That a man was a cleric was a part of the who, what, where, when, and how long context that underwrote all rights and obligations. The relationships between spiritual jurisdictions and temporal jurisdictions were managed and conflicts adjudicated from within the overall paradigm of the peace. A peace that was only possible, as we saw earlier, because of the ascent into faith and charity. That is to say, a peace that was only real because grace was real, which is to say, a peace that was simply the church. As one treatise on kingship begins, the whole church is made up of two orders, clergy and laity, as if two sides of one body. There was no inherent conflict here. Conflicts, rather, could arise anywhere in the field of action, anywhere in the complex society that was the church. The fabric of the peace could be torn anywhere, by clerics as easily as by laymen, by the misappropriation of temporal power as easily as that of spiritual power. So what I want to do now is show how such a social order was actually governed, if not by a state. How was it organized in order to accomplish objectives? This is at first glance a problem. The king judged and maintained this order, but he was not able to manipulate it bend it, redirect it, or appropriate its resources in the manner of the modern state. Rights, as we have seen, were diffused throughout society. The king could not control them. However, it does not follow from this that large-scale action was impossible. Large-scale action had to be achieved not through the appropriation of resources and power to the center in the fashion of the state, but through the coordination of the differentiated resources and power of various actors. The king himself, the king could not himself control the resources of the kingdom, but what if he could get the men who did control them to join him in an initiative? What if he could bind them to him in a pact of loyalty, even friendship? Indeed, what if he could build a network of friends aimed at a certain initiative or a certain vision of right order? Such friendships could not be forced or administered or organized through a bureaucracy, but they could certainly be managed through a code of right behavior a code that had its own enforcement mechanisms that lay outside what we would consider government, but that rather participated in the same divine justice that was the source of a society's very cohesion, its peace. Such a network of friends would have no place for our concepts of church and state, for there is no reason why a bishop could not be friends with a knight or with the king himself. Such a network would operate within the differentiated space discussed above, within which both spiritual and temporal power function, rather than over and against it. When we approach the sources without the categories of church and state, without them obscuring our view, such networks become visible. We can see that social power was wielded not through controlling proto-absolutist institutions such as the church or the state, but through building networks of cooperation of loyalty, of friendship, of what the sources call concilium et auxilium, counsel and aid. One rendered counsel and aid when he used the resources at his disposal, his liberties and rights, be they economic, political, or spiritual, in the service of another. People in a relationship of mutual counsel and aid had united their purposes and their power toward a common end and shared responsibility for each other's actions. It was such networks of friends made up as much of bishops as of lords, of friars as of townspeople, and of canons as of knights, that governed and which contended with each other for control. If we must find politics somewhere, it is here. <laughs>
We should pause to see the significance of this form of social organization. To give counsel and aid to one's neighbor was a universal precept of Christianity, something that was owed by all to all. And so fundamentally, the rendering of counsel and aid was not a matter of relative rights, but it was a matter of moral obligation. What this means is that networks of counsel and aid had intrinsic to them common moral understandings in the service of which they functioned. If they lacked this, they would break up, with members refusing to deploy their resources in the service of an immoral or unjust objective. It was divine justice, after all, that underwrote whatever legitimacy one could claim in this society. To knowingly act with injustice was to, sur was to surrender one's legitimacy. And so, rendering counsel and aid to the right people in the right circumstances was a part of what it meant to be orthodox. And doing so to the wrong people in the wrong circumstances was a part of what it meant to be heretical, or at least sinful. And so we can see that these networks were, in the ideal, nothing short of groupings of friends who made each other's interests their own in charity, while being united in faith. Because they were groupings of fallen men in history, in truth, this charity and this faith remained relative, only approaching charity and faith proper to the extent that their members approached true virtue. Conflicts, therefore, occurred between these networks. And peace occurred not when they made a treaty or formed an alliance, but when the networks merged into each other. The network of the king, which grew to include the papacy, sought to incorporate all the kingdom into its circle of friends. This was how it made peace. The ideal kingdom, the kingdom of peace, was a kingdom of faith and charity, of true friendship between man and man and between man and God. This ideal kingdom, if it could be achieved, would be nothing short of the very kingdom of God, the Catholic Church understood in its broadest sense. For the Church herself, the Society of the Baptized, was in the ideal a single network of counsel and aid. So now we need to pull all this together. Peace and organization for action, then, were to be found always through both the spiritual and the temporal powers. Indeed, peace required both powers, though in different ways. In true peace, the spiritual power would be active in the sense that it was the conduit through which grace flowed into society. Into society. The temporal power was active in the sense that it provided organization and direction to the grace-filled community as it satisfied the necessities of life. In true peace, of course, the new law of the gospel would be, would be completely interiorized, and so even the threat of the sword would be out of place. In the ideal of true peace, both the spiritual and temporal powers were essential, but neither the spiritual nor the temporal sword would function. The swords functioned when the peace was broken. In the realm of sin, sacramental grace was cut off, both by the action of the sinner and by the positive action of the priesthood, most clearly through the sword of excommunication. In the realm of sin, the iron sword emerged as that which forged an exterior peace, the peace possible under the exteriorized law, the peace which reigned under the old law in of itself. The temporal power sought to build a society of virtue. The object of human society, St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, was precisely such a virtuous life. But the spiritual power was necessary for the achievement of this object, because true virtue was not possible without grace. If it were otherwise, Aquinas asserts, kings would stand alone in their governance of society, which they do not. What is more, the end of human society was not simply the life of virtue, but rather through it to achieve the enjoyment of God, which was perfect peace. This required the grace of the sacraments and the knowledge of divine revelation, both given by the spiritual power. The royal and the priestly were therefore distinct, but united in a single endeavor that was rooted in the united kingship and priesthood of Christ himself. True peace is what undoes sovereignty. Such true peace is what undoes sovereignty. And true peace is always only possible through both law and grace, both the temporal and the spiritual powers. The undo undoing of the religious-secular dichotomy is the undoing of sovereign power. So from here, we can try to rewrite history. We can see within this reading that the construction of legal institutions during the 12th and 13th centuries was not a part of the process of secularization, the process of building the foundations of the state at the expense of monastic and mystical faith, as it is often depicted in the mythology of modernity. Rather, it was the opposite. It was the effort to convert more and more of the world from violence to true peace, 
to produce in the law the bridge from fallen nature to redeemed nature. This was, of course, simply the dynamic of salvation itself, from fallen nature to the law and through the law to grace. It was the movement from the historical nature to the allegorical faith on through the tropological charity to the goal, the anagogical, which motivated the whole dynamic through hope. The more successful this dynamic of salvation was, however, the more the juridical distinctions between the spiritual and the temporal powers would break down, because more and more of the specific law, both spiritual and temporal, that governed the interactions between people would be absorbed into the general law of charity, the common understanding of faith, and the life of peace. We can see this dynamic most clearly in the monastic ideal from which the entire reform movement of the High Middle Ages emerged. The monasteries were filled with both clerics, the ordained, and lay people, the unordained. But their internal life was governed by one positive law, the rule, specifying the new law of the gospel. And that life was aimed first and foremost at the interiorization of the gospel completely, at perfect peace. Through this interiorization, the work of the monks in the fields or scriptorium and their work in the choir merged into a single liturgical reality that lived from sacramental grace. We could, if we were so inclined, dissect, dissect the functioning of an ideal monastery and sort its life into temporal and spiritual categories, but why? It was a single life, fully temporal and fully spiritual. This was the new law lived by the religious, the model for all Christian society. The reform movement poured out of the, monaster the monasteries in the late 11th and through the 12th century. And the law built by both the spiritual and temporal powers of the high middle ages is more properly seen as emerging out of the rules and customaries of these religious houses um, and as attempting to turn all of Christendom into a single sacramental community of friends rather than as emerging from the abstract study of the law of the Roman Empire. By the turn of the 13th century, the married life itself, the seeming antithesis of the monastic life, was being referred to as the oldest religious order. And of course, knighthood had become a clear religious undertaking. Such active lives, St. Thomas tells us, are properly ordered to the contemplative life. All human action is in pursuit of contemplation, which is perfect peace. It is not a coincidence that the same period that saw the massive expansion of the exterior law, exterior law which we might call the rule of Christendom, saw also the so-called discovery of the individual, the emphasis on interiorization. The movement from the exterior to the interior is the very movement of Christian spiritual life, a movement that underwrote the entire monastic enterprise. Within this movement, the exterior law is not destroyed or somehow rendered moot by the coming of Christ. Rather, Christ makes the interior law achievable always through the exterior law, always as the fulfillment of the law and not as its antithesis. What we are seeing is the construction of a sacramental social order. Like a monastery, the universal church was as temporal as it was spiritual, as external as it was internal. It was made up of both laymen and clerics, uh, both, uh, made up the society made up of both laymen and clerics, kings and popes, but the temporal and the spiritual did not line up distinctly under one order or the other. They were distinct, but they were everywhere and always together. This unity was most perfectly expressed at the Mass, where God was present in body and spirit, where the bread and the wine of temporal power of lay human industry and organization were turned into the body and blood of Christ through the spiritual power of the priesthood and where the whole membership of the church was united to each other and to God, both spiritually and corporally. This was a taste of salvation, a moment of the fulfillment of all law and the love of God and of neighbor, of the perfect regime that was the Ecclesia. It is not a coincidence that the 13th century was a period of intense Eucharistic piety. The Mass was indeed the perfect sacrament, but all of the Ecclesia was sacramental, Every aspect of the social life of the body of the baptized had intrinsic to it temporality and spirituality. The final piece of this understanding of Christian society is the recognition that its realization as a society of perfect peace was ultimately impossible. Perfection in faith and charity was something to be strived for and something to approach, but never something to, to, to be actually achieved in this life and before the consummation of the world. This means that the world always had an eschatological dimension to it. What it pursued was ultimately beyond the reach of man and time. However, it was continually sought, because along with charity and faith, the realm of peace was the realm of the virtue of hope. 
Hope was what caused mankind to never settle for the realm of violence, for the so-called peace of the world that was possible through coercion. Hope was what kept the realm of charity and faith always under construction and the realm of violence under perpetual reform. What the medievals would see, perhaps, in modern politics is the loss of this hope, despair. To despair is to settle for the realm of exteriorized law. <coughs> Excuse me. To despair is to settle for the realm of exteriorized law, the realm of violence, and the compromised peace of this world. Charity and faith might remain ideals, but the ideal is shifted exclusively to an otherworldly realm, to heaven, entrance to which is no longer something that mankind finds through struggle and with the aid of sacramental grace, through actual transformative virtue, but rather something that is or is not given to him regardless of a life lived entirely in the realm of sin which, with the possibility of true virtue removed, is all there is in this life. The political aspect of the dynamic of salvation, the legal aspect that reached down into sin or back to the law, the old law, is thereby absolutized and the modern state emerges. Can we not perhaps see that the growth of the assumption of primordial violence in political theory is really a part of the same historical movement as that of the development of the doctrine of the total depravity of man and of the denial of transformative grace? Is it not really the denial of the social possibility of the new law of the gospel, the denial of the possibility of real peace and charity, which is to say that it is a denial of the church itself, and the assertion that the best that can be hoped for is a type of concord, some sort of social contract? The transformational sacramenta of the church, which since the construction of the Carolingian Empire had been the conventional bond of unity in society, becomes the sacramentum of Hobbes, the oath through which man surrenders to the sovereign his power to inflict violence, the covenant which is simply a contract made in fear. Faith and charity becomes ideological conformity and submission. What is more, once Christendom despaired of charity and accepted the realm of sin as its place of habitation, it seems a small step to dispense with heaven, the now socially irrelevant realm of peace altogether. It no longer exists on earth, after all, even imperfectly. Heaven may or may not be real, but this, this becomes a matter for this new thing called religion, because its existence simply does not matter in the realm of absolutized politics of simple history. To conclude, I'd like to quickly restate where we have been. First, by looking at the connection between heresy and violence, we saw that peace, the objective of modern politics, was integral to faith, the content of modern religion. The so-called secular world was the so-called religious world. Then we saw how sovereignty did not exist because this peace was a real thing and not simply the product of violence. This real peace, however, was only possible because of grace and so actual charity. This real peace, then, provided the space within which, within which the temporal and spiritual powers operated together, and it was completely dependent on this operation. Then we saw how government happened within this peace through networks of friends united in charity and faith, networks that necessarily included both temporal and spiritual powers, and that hope was what drove the whole dynamic forward. Finally, we saw how the categories and concepts that emerge from this reading of society can offer an alternative narrative of modernity. So let me end with a quote from Hostiensis, one of the most important canonists of the 13th century. He wrote, There are three types of men, and through them the Trinity can be perceived. The laity are similar to the Father through power, the secular clerics to the Son through wisdom, and the religious to the Holy Spirit on account of benevolence and grace. These three types, namely the laity, the secular clergy, and the religious are Trinity, but in the holy union of the church and in the Catholic faith, they are a unity. Likewise, the persons of the Father and the Son and the Spirit are a trinity, but in essence and divinity, a unity. All of society and all the complexity of history is included in this vision. If secularity and violence are the concepts that underwrite modern politics, the trinity, with its difference and its peace, is the concept that ultimately underwrote medieval social order.